What is going on? Welcome back to another episode of It's a Blast Podcast. My name is Mike, also known as the EOD Happy Captain on X. If you like the content that I'm producing, I'd really appreciate if you'd like and subscribe and leave a comment down below. Today I'm talking to Chuck Ritter. Decorated multiple times for Valor and multiple Purple Hearts, he tells me his story and his leadership philosophy. Let's get started. Welcome to the It's a Blast podcast. My name is Mike. Here, I talk to members of the veteran and military community about their leadership style and how the military has affected their lives. Let's get started. What is going on? I am sitting down with Chuck Ritter, the former deputy commandant of the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare College NCO Academy and all around badass. Uh, Chuck, what's going on, man? How are you doing? Doing all right. How are you doing? I'm doing good, man. It's it's good to talk to you. You know, we've interacted quite a bit on uh, on X or Twitter or whatever whatever the kids are calling it these days. But you know, want to sit down with you and kind of talk about as as you start your transition into retirement, talk about your career, your time in the army, your leadership philosophy, and you know, uh, just all around like what makes a person who has been through so much stick around for so long. Right. So the, the, for those of you that don't know who Chuck is, uh, you're going to find out. Right. So let's start with like pre army. Right. I mean, it, was the military always something that you were interested in doing? I've always been interested in the military to nerd out on like Soviet vehicles and aircraft. And both my parents were in the Air Force. My, my mom was an officer. My dad was enlisted. But I never really thought I would be able to make it in the military, maybe when I was like 14, but then when I was 15 and 16, I was a little bit of a, I don't know, I was a pretty bad kid, um, like really bad kid. Uh, you know, I'm talking like, I don't think I ever got above a 60 in any of my classes in school. I have to go through summer school until my graduation year, which I went to a special school and just front loaded all of it. And uh, actually really didn't get my high school diploma in a way I, I should have. I don't know if you've heard that story yet or not, but uh, you know, I was one credit away from having a high school diploma and this recruiter kept bothering me. He's like, you want to join the army? Like, yeah, I, don't, I don't think I want to join the army. <clears throat> so he showed up at my house one weekend after I'd done this big party. My parents had gone out of town and they locked me out of the house to, you know, find a way to sneak in. Do this big party, cleaning up on a Sunday. I'm all hung over and this recruiter shows up at my door. You know, trying to clean up. And this, this dude has my transcripts and he has my diploma. He's like, hey, man. He's like, you kept telling me you're not going to join the army because you, you haven't finished high school. You're still missing algebra. He's like, I'm telling you, you graduated high school. All you have to do is go to MEPS with me tomorrow, and I will give you these documents and you're a high school graduate. Congratulations. So I was going to this special school where you went 20 hours a week. It's a long story. But so I was like, okay, man, I got to go to MEPS tomorrow. So, um, you know, this probably shouldn't say this out loud. People say you shouldn't say this out loud, but this is the truth. I called my buddy up. I was like, hey, I need you to bring over all the weed you got right now because I have a drug <laughs> test I'm going to take tomorrow that I cannot pass. He's like, what do you mean? Like, Who doesn't want to pass the drug test? Like, Shut up and come over. So I went to MEPS with the recruiter. He gave me my high school diploma and like later that week, uh, maybe the week after, he called up and he's like, hey man, like, you know, you can't join the army. You you failed the drug test. Like, oh, that sucks, right? But I, got, I graduated <laughs> high school um, and then it was two years later where I, I finally got my shit together and I was like, hey man, uh, I need to do something with my life and I need to join the military because I'd already done that. I'd done some other things. In my past, I got a $70,000 um, credit card fraud thing um, where I got arrested yeah. working for Radio Shack, different story. Um, I actually got arrested for that. It, none of the charges stuck, but I was like, Hey man, I gotta, I gotta do something. Then, well, I also failed bowling class in, in college, which anyway, I was like, man, if, if I'm doing this, I've got to do something. And it, it took almost an act of God to come to the military because of that stuff. I had to get a letter from a congressman saying I was a change man and all this other nonsense. And that stuff has haunted me my entire career, obviously. Um, but yeah, that was my pre-Army days. Uh, I mean, I could go into more detail about what a dumbass I was. But yeah, not a good kid, uh, not physically fit. You know, my, I was pretty good at boxing and wrestling, but other than that, not very athletic. Um, not somebody you would, you would picture ever joining the military. In fact, my parents had a bet. They said, my dad bet that 
there was no way I was going to pass basic training. My mom bet that I, I would pass. And I didn't know they made that bet until I graduated AIT and they exchanged some money. I was like, what, what's going on there? And they told me, uh, yeah, it was yeah, pretty much a lost cause. So, I mean, point. you know, you said you said not being in shape. How, how was basic training for you going to Fort Benning? Yeah, Fort Benning signed up as a, a young infantryman. You take that first initial PT test right up, right up front. Scored a whopping 93 out of 300 points. So you got to get a 180 to pass. And I post that online. People are like, there's no way. How do you get a 93? How, how do you get a 93? Right? You start by, they give you a briefing. They say, hey, you can walk, but it's not recommended on the run. And I, I took that to heart. So I ran a whopping 24-minute two-mile at first two-mile, which is zero points. And I think I did like 10 push-ups or something. So that's how you get 93 out of 300 points in the APFT. Now, when I graduated AIT, I had a 210, which when I, I thought I was like, oh man, I'm a stud now. And I showed up to my unit, like, you can't be showing up here in the infantry with a 210. What are you doing? You suck. So I still sucked when I, when I graduated. I thought it was awesome. But I think it's like, I think it's an important story for, for people to hear, right? Because, you know, obviously you've had a very storied career. Uh, you know, if I, if I Google your name, there's, there's a million articles and podcasts and photos that pop up. But, you know, looking back at where you started from, right, I think resonates probably with a lot of people in the fact that you, you weren't a good student, you'd been in some trouble, but you didn't come in as a physical specimen, right, uh, when you joined the Army. I mean, a 93, like, uh, that's pretty solid, you know what yeah. I mean? So what was that like, you know, your first duty station was Hawaii, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Still so what was that like? Hawaii. What was that like showing up to an infantry unit, um, you know, with the 210 and just kind of, you know, rocking up and down mountains and, and doing all the training out there. Well, I showed up and I thought with a 210, I was like, man, I'm a stud now. It's 93 to 210. This is, this is pretty awesome. I couldn't do one pull up when I showed up. So that was a big deal because I remember showing up in the first week. They don't care about anything. They just want to see what your physical fitness is and if you're there to, to play. So I took a PT test, scored like a 210, and then I did one pull up and they were like, whoa. What is going on here? So I was kind of on like a little fat boy program at first. And <clears throat> there was one week, I remember I got my PT test up to a 250. I'm like, man, I'm, I'm rocking this, right? And uh, the commander's like, no, you're going to take a PT test every single week and, until you score 280. We don't do that here. You know? And then that's what happened. And, you know, we are just getting beat down. I finally got that 280 and eventually started scoring a, a 300 regularly. And that was back then the, the run standard was like 1154 so that was still much smaller than i am now and then it, it changed after that 13 minutes and then you know scoring scoring 300 was relatively easy at that point but yeah it took a while it took me about i don't know probably eight months into being an infantryman before i was probably physical what i would consider you know physically where i needed to be and um, you know they put me on a machine gun team so i was on a machine gun team for a year and a half until uh, i got to where i needed to be that was that was there way of getting me physically fit, I guess, and it worked. So Yeah. So what you know, what was the driving factor between uh or for going to selection? Because this is all pre nine eleven, right? Mm, yep. Yeah. In fact I went to selection before nine eleven and I had made the decision that I wasn't going to go to the T course. That I was going to come to the eighty second at that point. But when I was, you know, a young E five out of Schofield Barracks uh, First special forces group teams would come over and train fairly regularly. And I remember just being at the mount site one time. The, for, you know, those are not the military mount sites, just basically an urban combat site, it's like a mock village um, or houses. And they would come and just do cool stuff. They'd fly in, they'd fast rope down, blow off all the doors, and you know, just doing awesome stuff. Where you know, it would take us forever to go through these 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 sites. And they were coming in, doing it a couple minutes, and you know, hit some really cool stuff. A recruiter came down and gave us pitch and like i think this is something i want to try and uh you know put it in my packet with a couple of the guys and we went to a selection which kind of made us we we're like pariahs over there because there was this jrtc coming up like you can't go to selection during jrtc like there's no way and they're trying to stop it and then we went to selection anyway and then once we got selected they were like, so, i think that like yeah. still prevails in the army today uh when when people try to go uh, to selection when there's other stuff going on at the unit and there's always other stuff going on at the unit. So, you know, going to selection, um, 
were you ready for that? You know, after being in Schofield Barracks, you'd obviously bumped up your PT test or was that a real gut check for you as well? I thought so, uh, but I, I overtrained and I, I messed up my knee really bad about four months before the selection date. And uh, that kind of put me behind a little bit. And so when I showed up, I was kind of broken. Selection, I wasn't physically where I, where I wanted to be by any means. And it definitely got checked. Selection, Special Forces selection is probably harder now than it was when I went through because I'm out there quite a bit. And I see what, what these guys do. I'm like, wow, I was actually able to survive that. That's ridiculous. But it was, it's, it's tough. Like, don't let anybody ever fool you. Like, it, I don't care what kind of shape you're in. You go there, you're going to be. You're going to be worn out and it's going to test you to the limits. But, you know, even in selection, I was a, I was a risk. I had to go to the board. Like, you know, at the end of selection, if, if you've done something that's a little bit, uh, you know, risky, they're going to, they're going to put you before the board. And there was an incident that happened there with a weapon where, where somebody had given me their weapon on a truck and we hit a bump and like hit the ceiling and the weapon flew at the back. And I was like, Hey, I gave him my weapon. I was like, Hey, I went to the instructor. I was like, yep. Yeah. Weapon flew at the back of the truck. Um, at the board, like they were like, well, you know, this serial member will belong to this guy, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, this is what happened. Like, All right, well, we're going to, you're a risk, but we're going to select you anyway. So you know, that was pretty nerve wracking. You know, I lost this dude's weapon. So you know, it was my fault. I should have, I should have tied his gun down to me, um, which is what you're supposed to do. Uh, they selected me and I came back and, and I was like, well, I don't want to go SF um, for whatever reason. I don't know why. I'm just going to go to the 82nd. And then I got a phone call. I was like, hey, you are going to selection. We've deleted your orders 82nd. You really don't have a choice. I mean, I'm sorry, you're going to the Q course. You're going to become a special forces weapons sergeant. And then I went to the Q course in route. I went to, hold on, let me just finish this. Or you don't know about the story. I went to airborne school in route and actually broke my, my ankle, my very first jump. So I was in a cast for six months and didn't graduate airborne school. My first go around either. Jesus. Yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> I feel like, you, you get hurt a lot, man. Yeah, you know, I pulled my slip at like 150 feet. Not a smart move. Um, Do you get a, a choice? Move. Like, like when you, you know, for those that don't understand, like, you know, you're, you're an 18 Bravo weapons sergeant. Do you get a choice? Do you get to say like, Hey, I want to be a Bravo or, you know, maybe I want to be a Charlie, be an engineer, be a Delta a medic. Is that a choice that you get when you're there? Or is it kind of based on performance and scores? So you get a choice. You get to put your preferences of what MOS you want, where you want to go, what language you prefer, right? Um, but the reality is it's just dependent upon what they need. Most guys get the MOS they want, but I want the third special forces group. I think that was like fifth on my list. And, you know, definitely French wasn't on there, which I ended up speaking or learning. But for the MOS, generally, if that's if you really want to be a Delta, if you put that on there like a medic, then they're going to put you over there. You know, most of our most of our special forces medics are kind of weird. It takes a, a weird person to do that. And you want them to be that That's, person because they're good at it. Uh, yeah, I know one of them. Uh, so my brother went through selection in 2002 and uh, was an 18 Delta and went out to 10th Group for, for years. And now he's like, get this shit. Now he is a neurosurgeon resident out in San Antonio, nice. Texas. So That's like awesome. he's been in the Army now for 22, 23 years. He's a captain like me. I mean, definitely not like me. He's way, way smarter than I am. But like, he's literally in San Antonio, Texas, wearing civilian clothes every day. And he's a brain surgeon, right? Or he's going to be a brain surgeon. Like, shit's wild to me. Every every time we talk, it's just like when we talk about, you know, what the military does for people. You know, he came in in 2002. He was a waiter at a restaurant. And then was like, 9-11 happened. He went right to the recruiting station said, this is what I want to do, came in on the 18 x-ray program, which had just like started back up uh, post-Vietnam around that time. And like, I think he graduated selection at something like 113 pounds. Like the, the Via Hermosas, we are little people, That's you know? Uh, so like he graduated like at 113, became an 18 Delta and like, you know, the military paid for his college. They paid for him to get, he did the pilot program for enlisted to doctors. Nice. And so like there was like a thousand applicants. They picked up 15 people and uh, yeah, dude, he went to med school, got selected for neurosurgery. And so like now we talk and when people hear my story, cause I'm prior enlisted now an officer, people are like, Oh man, you have such a great story. I'm like, I really don't like, I'm still the black sheep of the family. Right? Like the student has always, always one up to me just like a little, little bit. 
But, you know, let's talk about, you know, your your time at group. Let's talk about your uh, I got 2008 you. diploma. So I got an answer for that, you. You put that in perspective, right? So he chose to do a job to, to fix brains, right, to make them healthier. And you're in a job yeah. that causes brain damage. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Okay. It, it's, it's, you know, he, he does, you know, uh, spines. You can help him out right? later in life, right? right? Like when you get to a certain oh. point, enough explosions. Oh, a hundred percent. You know, like when, when we talk about uh, TBI, which, you know, we're going to talk about here in a little bit, but, you know, kind of understanding, I don't think we fully understand as a military and as a society, what blast wave damage does to people, you know, uh, and, and we're going to find out in the next 20 to 30 years, right? Like what the, what the cause and effect was of all this you know, uh, TBI detonations too close to you, or even self-inflicted, right? When we talk about firing recoilless rifles nonstop, and, and you know all that stuff that you did as a as an eighteen Bravo, um, we're gonna find out what it does. But you know, in, in that vein, let's kind of talk about two thousand eight. You're on an ODA. Uh, you know, you're you're in an RG thirty one. So you guys are getting some of the first up armored vehicles in country, uh, and you get blown to shit. I mean, can you kind of talk about that situation and what happened? Yeah, so we were in Helmand Province, and I don't think this is my third or fourth trip to Afghanistan at this point. I don't remember. We're in this, we're in Helmand Province up north of the river. Anytime we left the wire, we knew we knew where to cast, whether it was IEDs or, or direct fire. It's a nasty place. Where I remember before that, we'd flown over to the UAE for three months, and we were training up with their special forces to deploy them. To Afghanistan, it was, and, uh, as we were infilling into the, the fire base, we had this huge convoy, and you know, one of the big wig UAE shakes or whatever had donated this nice shower unit because there's no showers up there. This thing like had gold plated stuff on it. And on the way up to the fire base, the, the Taliban had blown that up somehow, and also had all of our we'd stuffed that thing through full of all our food too, so this thing burned up. Oh, that's gonna be a great trip. Uh, and it was like that, you know, the fire base is getting attacked every night. It was just a wild west out there. So we finally get these mine resistant vehicles in the country and they fly us down to Kandahar to do the class on them and sign for them and then take them back to the fire base. So we'd spend a week training up on these things with the new remote turret systems that nobody had ever seen before. And these things were cool. Um, rigged up a nice sound system in, in ours like, so we could, you know, have some jams. Because you can't hear it outside in that thing anyway. Uh, so we'd load it up. We're taking three RGs back to the fire base. The front one had a mine roller on it. I was in the middle one captain and i was gunning so we had our our engineer our senior engineer who's driving uh, our team leader the captain was in the tc seat i'm right behind the driver on the gunner seat 50 cal in mine and then right beside me sitting directly next to me was our jtac and then behind him was our, our junior engineer and we left i think midnight maybe um and we were about 30 minutes in and i got the, the name of the song that was jamming on the radio i don't remember off the top of my head right now but i got it written down Jam up this song, and next thing I know, like it's all black, and um, I'm like upside down or kind of sideways, and I hear the captain like, "Chuck, you okay?" I was like, "Yeah, I'm good." And I was like, "How's everybody else?" I was like, "I think Bill's dead." And I looked over next, I was like, "Yeah, I think Will's dead too." And then it took a while for the guys to get to us because the lead RG had also um, been hit, um, not quite as bad as ours. Ours hit like a 500 pound uh, explosive under a culvert. It actually lifted it up. It threw it about 50 meters down the road. It was facing the wrong way, and you can't even recognize it if you see it. So the fact that anybody survived shows the vehicle works. Um, right. But, yeah, so stuck in there, they, they they got me out of there, and I didn't, like, all these front teeth, the whole front of my jaw was, was destroyed, and my nose, and I had a, a number of skull fractures, and ribs were broken, and it crushed uh, you know, my femurs and, and everything else. And then there was the junior engineer. He was still alive. Uh, but he was like pretty jacked up too. Uh, he got banged around in the back with all the ammo cans and everything. And yeah, flew out of there. It took four years to to get officially medically cleared for duty. I snuck into a 2010 deployment where I was missing my front teeth, and I got in a little bit of trouble for that. Uh, you know, you lied on your your medical stuff. I was like, well, how do you? Know? What makes well, you you know not to interrupt, right? But like, what? What makes you want to come back from that? I guess is kind of the question, right? So, I mean, you know, you're in a vehicle where there's multiple KIA, um, everyone's jacked up. I mean, like your face is a wreck. 
you know, uh, we'll talk about behavioral health and the mental toll here in a minute. I mean, that's a, you could be done if you wanted to, you know, I'm sure after that you could have said, you know what, uh, I'm done with this job. I'm, I'm, I'm done. Right. And med boarded out of the military. And, and quite frankly, I don't think anybody would have judged you for that. You know, you, you went through hell. So like what makes somebody say, not only am I going to go back, but I'm going to go back two years before I'm probably ready to go back. And I'm going to lie uh, in order to go back. Like what makes somebody do that? That's a great question. Uh, I'm not really sure I have an honest answer for you. Like the, the true why, like what, what drives you. I mean, part of it's proving to yourself that you can do it right. That, yeah, I think for me, at some point in time in my life, after being such a weirdo when I was younger and, and finally getting in the right mindset, right, I, I'm a firm believer that anybody or nobody's a lost cause. I mean, maybe some people are, right? But I think that most people, if they are mentored properly or influenced at the right time, they can always change a faulty mindset. It almost always takes something devastating or some kind of catastrophic event to check somebody's ego and, and check their mind to a point to where they can make that shift. But I think when I finally decided to make that shift, I convinced myself that I'm an unstoppable force in nature in life. And besides God, there's nothing that's ever going to stop me from achieving my goals and whatever instincts in my mind. And that I always know that, you know, even if I'm kicked down to the dirt, that I'm always going to stand back up. I'm always going to climb back on top and I'm going to dominate and I'm going to get to get to my instinct. And uh, I think that that was just in my mind is like, OK, this is an obstacle. And now this is trying to prove me wrong, and I'm not going to let that prove me wrong. I think that was the real reason why. In that particular case, I was so hell bent on getting back into into the fight somehow. You know, so yeah, I mean, maybe that, 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 that one there was probably fairly selfish, right? Like, man, I got to do this for me. Or you know, later, like you know, I've been shot and whatnot. Well, I'm sure we'll talk about that. I think the drive was a little bit different, but yeah, that. That, for that particular instance, it's, it's hard to treat. Yeah, I mean, you know, and going back, you know, you said you had four years worth of surgeries. You went back in 2010, so two years after that happens. And so you deploy again, uh, missing your front teeth, right? Yeah, um, I still miss my teeth. In fact, that's one of the reasons why the CSM is like, here's how I know you lied on your back. Well, so for one, you're missing your front teeth. For two, I called right. your surgeon. You said you definitely had at least two, maybe three surgeries. And three, your site said they haven't cleared you, so I'm not going to kick you off this deployment when you get back. You're prohibited from going anywhere, even being on a team, until you know I get a letter from your surgeon or a letter from your site. How was your performance, you know, on on that deployment? Because you're still dealing with a lot of medical stuff. You're still dealing at that time, you know. I'm sure with the psychological impacts of everything that had happened, uh, you know, in 2008. And so, did you notice, you know, an issue with your performance? Was it kind of like a you know, you'd mentioned, hey, it was kind of selfish for me to go back that soon. So, like, did you have any moments where you were like, man, maybe I shouldn't have done this. Like, maybe I should have waited a little bit longer. Or were you just good to go? I think I was pretty good to go on that trip. But where it caught up to me and bit me in the ass was right after that trip. So that trip, we were tasked with building the Afghan Special Forces program that came more in Afghanistan, which is that, though, that program that we built, those, those entities ended up holding the country together because it was also our company that built the, the commando program a couple of years prior to that. So this was right. just enough, the next step. But that trip, we lost quite a few people and I wasn't with them when they died, but I knew them well. And one of them, a guy named J.P. Thompson, he, he was a team leader who got killed. They flew us into that fire base about five hours after the incident happened where an interpreter shot him and shot one of the, the PSYOP kids and shot up the, the warrant officer as well. But that guy dying and then a couple other deaths it greatly affected me for, for, I think, it just all compounded. So right when we got back from that trip, I kind of went on a downward spiral mentally and found myself in a, a pretty good hole. And that was all just because I I didn't take a step back and take care of my own mental health and, and everything to that point. I did some cognitive therapy because even now, I got a lot of brain damage. All this has been rebuilt. I don't speak correctly sometimes, and it affects my speech. and and whatnot. I'd done a little bit of that for like speech and whatnot, but I hadn't really taken care of myself mentally as far as, Hey, like, you know, there's some damage there 
you know, not just physically, but internally from the loss and, and everything else. Let's, let's actually address that. And, you know, any, none of us are impenetrable, you know, none of us are, are that awesome to where it won't catch up to us at some point in time. So did you start seeing help or seeking help right after you came back from that 2010 deployment or, you know, was that a later on thing? No, it actually took me uh, going into a pretty dark place and then I sought help and then I was kind of surviving off of the rise of payment at the time because, you know, at that time we didn't have all these programs in place. I think we had one group psychiatrist, you know, we didn't have these, what we call them our Thor 3 programs, you know, the human performance programs in the military, we didn't have any of that in place. So I, so I didn't know any better. And the, the reality is like, I probably, I probably would have been finished with my recovery much sooner if we had those things, because I would do stupid stuff. Like I remember one time I had a bone graft because I had to rebuild this upper part of my jaw. So they cultivated bone from both sides of my, my lower jaw and they, they, they rebuilt this and everything was stitched up all the way around. And for some reason, I thought it would be a good idea to do a 12 mile rock the next day. So I called my buddy up and I'm like, Hey man, let's, let's go on this rock. And about halfway in my face is just, just hurt and I can see the my pulse in my left eye and uh, the blood pressure was so high that it actually loosened a screw that's up here and it's still loose to this day. So if I when I run I can I can see my pulse in my left eye. I think it's just a nerve. I don't think it's actually a blood vessel or anything, but doing things like that over and over again because I didn't have those checks and balances from a trainer, or a physical therapist and, and somebody psychologically to kind of tell me I was being a dumbass. But when I got in that dark hole and I, you know, it's hard to climb your way out by yourself. And I, and I started seeing a therapist and really kind of relying on my friends and, you know, getting out of that. Then I had the realization, like, okay, oh, that was dumb. I'm never going to do that again. And then on top of that, I started looking at the guy that was in the back of the RG that actually survived to the junior engineer. He didn't do anything. He didn't do any of the cognitive therapy that I was doing. And he, he ignored all his mental issues and he spiraled really quickly to a point to where he got kicked out of the military because of not being all there mentally. And it's all because he ignored everything and he decided that he was going to be stronger than, than that. And I don't think any of us are. So yeah, we, we reap that at the end of the day, at the end of the day it's going to catch up to you. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, I totally agree with you, you know, um, so, you know, obviously I've never been anything through, through what you've been through. Right. But for me, uh, you know, my 2010, 11 deployment, it was pretty rough. Um, and so like, didn't get any help, nothing like that. And then I did Kosovo, believe it or not, I did Kosovo in 2020, which is just like, you know, if you want a deployment and I don't, I'm not even sure we can call it a deployment, right? Like if you want a rotation, let's call it that, um, you know, you're out there, you're getting all your special, you know, duty pays and, you know, the, the populace loves you. You'll stop at a stoplight. Someone will bring you coffee because you, you're an American, right? And they love Americans. And so I came back from that rotation and I did my post-deployment health assessment and my doc called me. So this is during COVID, right? So this is, you know, you're not seeing anybody in person. And my doc called me. He's like, hey, you need to go to behavioral health. And I said, dude, what, what the hell for, right? I mean, I just had like the greatest deployment uh, in the history of deployments, you know? And he goes, yeah, I'm looking at your 2010, 11 deployment and you got some, some stuff you should probably get seen for. And so like, that was for me, the catalyst to, to go see somebody and get some help and like night and day difference, right? Night and day difference as far as like some of the stuff that we talked about, uh, in, in therapy sessions and stuff like that. And so, I mean, I think that's important for anybody listening to understand that it doesn't matter, like you said, who you are or what you've done, uh, no one's impenetrable, no one is Superman and, you know, going forward and and getting the help that quite frankly, you deserve. Right. Um, so thanks for telling that story. Uh, let's talk about, you know, you, you spend four years recovering and then you deploy again and you get caught in just an absolutely hellacious firefight. Um, you know, multiple people getting hurt and killed. Uh, yourself included, right? Getting wounded in action. Can we, can we talk about that story, you know, for a little bit? I think at that point, you're, you're the 18 Zulu, right? You're, you're the team lead. Uh, what happened? Yeah, so prior to this is 2013, 2012, I was supposed to take over a different team. We deployed to Tajikistan. And I was on the Tajik, the Tajik side of the border, um, working counter drug stuff. 
and then come back and we deployed Afghanistan and we're now we're you know we're on the Afghan side of the border because countries are together. Um where would the national strike force at a Camp Moorhead for the commandos that trip? So we've done a number of missions and they're all it's all petty. Like if you're if you're doing a, a six special operations candag mission, it's you're not you know you're not bringing candy shaking hands, you're there to bring down the hammer because you're there to make a statement or you want for some kind of high value target. So in this particular mission, they actually flew people down from the soda because like, hey, this is where you're going is very nice. And that you guys are gonna go into this valley and we're gonna clear it out because it's historically been, you know, an enemy stronghold. We've tried to clear it out multiple times in the past. It's never worked and you can't keep a presence there. So you guys are gonna go in. Cool. You know, but there's a force ratio at the time which said that you could only take one green beret with 10 Afghans, which the math with the weight, you know, there's a lot of math and planning that goes into these missions, not just like you get on a plane. So I'm, I'm working out HLZs and the load plans. And, okay, by well, my math, with the weight limits that they've given us for these CH 47s, we can only take 77 people on the ground. And the estimated enemy force in the valley was 300 with the ability to reinforce 600, 800 if they need. And, and those numbers seem very high. And to have been in Afghanistan for, you know, many, many rotations at that point. So I kind of scoffed at it. Like, There's no way. These are inflated. They're always inflated. And one of the intel people had flown down. They're like, no, like, this is real. Like, this is real. So we flew in our sister team that was with us the, one night, and they ran into a huge enemy force in this valley to the north of where we were going. And they came back like, look, these estimates are correct. Like, they have this many fighters, and they are very determined, and they're very good, and they know the land. I expect one hell of a fight in, in this area. <laughs> So we prepared as best we could. You know, I remember at one point the soda called in, like, well, why are you only taking this many people? Like, well, they've given me 6,500 pounds on the aircraft, you know, because the weight matters depending on like the elevation, distance, and fuel. They're, they're going to give you your planning weights. I'm like, well, um, you need to take more people. They'll give me another bird. Like, no, that's another question. I remember arguing, I forget who it was, like, Chuck, you, you don't understand what I'm telling you. Like, if you want to take more green berets, just take more Afghans. That would work if there was an infinite. You know, lift capacity was bird, but it's not real. And they're like, you're just not understanding. It. I guess not. But this is what we're going in with because this is what you give me, right? <laughs> this is, you've given me these limitations, and this is the math, and I've tested this stuff. I've done these lift tests, you know, hundreds of times. Like, this is where it is. So we go into this valley, and um, sure enough, it's, it is crazy right off the bat. Right when we land, they're shooting the aircraft, and it's night, and the terrain is, is just wild. Like, they didn't show the, the depth of the poppy fields in any of the imagery, so. You know, I'm relying on AC-130 to kind of laze this in. Like, yep, this is the best way. We're like, okay, this sucks. So we start going in, and uh, we're trying to be quiet. And we get to what we think are going to be our battle positions because our, our plan was, hey, we're going to we're going to set up to where we have the advantage, and we're going to bait the fighters out into kill zones and attrit as much of this enemy force as we can while we go back and back clear some of these compounds of interest that we know that these high value people hang out in. Uh, and it, that usually worked, but here the terrain was was such that that wasn't going to work, work. We got to our first battle position where like, this is not, you know, a tenable position. Like we can't defend this. This is ridiculous. So um, we spent almost until sunrise looking for battle positions. We settled on two. We usually set up three, set up, set up two, and then I was like, okay, hey, I'm going to go down for a 30 minute power nap. And my team started nap, so I think in the morning, and I wasn't down for more than five minutes, and all of a sudden I had this, you know five or six people jumping in on me in this, in this room. Like, what the hell's going on? A bunch of explosions and gunfire. They throw, they were throwing grenades right over the wall, so they were right on top of us. So that start of the day off, you know, where we were surrounded, and they were within five meters of our positions, and there's really nothing we could do about it. And you had and, you had a grenade not go off, right? Like, right next to your position. Yeah, that's actually happened a lot. There's just a photo of that one where it's, like, right outside the door. But luckily... Yeah. A lot of those foreign grenades, they don't go off a lot of times. And then much of the time, you know, if you just lay down, you're going to miss any shrap. Or there's not made very well. So usually it's an explosion. You're going to take a concussion, but you're not going to take much damage. You just get down on the ground pretty quickly. Uh, but, yeah, that one's right outside. We ended up catching the dude that threw it, uh, you know, about 20 minutes later. We made him pick it up with a shovel and get rid of it. Because um, it was, like, right in the middle of our CCP. Or right in the middle of our, our CP, rather. Um so we did, we sent out a bunch of kill teams that morning. We were pushing these guys off of us, uh, probably about four hours of fighting. Uh, you know, we're hitting these guys with hellfire to come up on the drones. But, hey, we see X here. They got weapons. We're like, hit them. Um, at that point in time, AC-130 had been off station. We didn't have them back. 
we just got the whiskey models into where they could fly during the day because they were pressurized. And uh, we found that the enemy was setting up or massing to my south, my position, and we thought they were going to try to come around and and get us from a, a, a probably about 30 meters off of us. It looked like they were going to come around and get about 30 meters off of us and, and push into what our what we believed it was going to be their effort into our compound. So we're like, okay, well, I'll go behind. I'll take an element out. We'll get behind these guys and we'll ambush them on their way in. Um, so we, we hit part of their force with some hellfires and we went out and they ended up ambushing us. Um, so I don't know where they're getting their intel from. They just knew the area. They were, they were very good at what they were doing. So as we were coming out and I was, we were going to set up in our ambush position, I would go into this, this, this little field basically around this corner. The lead Afghan gets shot. He gets his fingers get shot off and he gets a through and through to the leg and he drops and all the other Afghans run away. And I'm, I'm like right up there. I'm looking around like nobody's around me because, you know, as a green beret, it's not like we have a bunch of Americans. I might, I might not see another American for 48 hours. It was me. Um, in this case, it was my senior Delta. And we had one CRD guy, one uh, NBC NCO. Or we, we use our NBC NCOs a little bit differently. There are our SSC experts. They always go on the objective with us and they run all our, all our SSC force. And he's, he's a junior guy and the, the rest are Afghans. So in our, in our medic, he's, he's always, you know, he's never in the lead. He's behind me because he's the medic. So right. I'm like, all right, all the Afghans left. Let's get him back up here. And this guy's like just out there in the middle of nowhere. We had two Apaches on station. I was like, well, I don't feel comfortable firing rockets. Like I need, Hey, I need, I need guns, you know, a little bit off so I can get out there and get this guy. Apaches were doing runs and runs. I'm like, hey, what is wrong? Why are they not shooting? Comes over. Hey, their guns are broken. Right. Both of them. I was like, both of them are broken. They're like, yep. Both their guns are broken. Get them off the raws and let's get something else in here. At the time, everything else was refueling, so it's all we had. And the Taliban were gonna—they were gonna snatch this Afghan. And to me, you know, risk to mission. You know, risk to mission here is if if they get this guy, this this whole campaign, which is supposed to last another two weeks, is over. And, you know, we're gonna be out here for the next 48 hours, and uh, on top of that, we're losing a friendly force. Like it's worth the risk to fight out into this close ambush, which I knew there was at least three machine guns and, and a number of other fighters out there to get this guy so we went out as like me the afghan platoon leader and like two or three other people fought out in this kill zone and these guys were good um right when we came out there was two people bounding uh probably about 10 15 meters away just textbook like you would think are if you guys bound like one guy shooting one guy right shoot. uh you know took care of them it was a, and then there was a machine gun each each apex uh pkm so got rid of one of them I thought we got rid of the other one, but obviously we didn't because I didn't get shot. But trying to drag this Afghan around the corner, you know, a lot of the Afghans run away again. It's like me, the, the team leader, and like one other guy out there, I think, fighting. And in the video, you've seen the helmet cam footage. If you actually watch the, the whole helmet cam footage, you can just hear me get my ass handed to me out there in a close ambush. Yeah, which, by the way, this guy like, around. like listening to that, foot, watching that footage, um, the level of calm. Like, I think that's kind of like the thing that struck me the most watching the footage of, of you getting hit, uh, talking to the 18 Delta, the medic on the ground and like a couple things. One, how fast you got your kid off, right? The fact that you're maintaining, you know, lines of communication with your people and still kind of directing what is going on as, as the team lead out there. Like, I think there's a misconception when people watch, you know, like war movies, right? That there's, you know, this crescendo of music and there's like, a, you know, a, a, we're going to, you know, zoom in on somebody's face. And like, it's so hellish. And it, yet at the same time, it's so calm, you know? And so like you, you said you got shot. I mean, I think that's, I think that's kind of downplaying a little bit, right? With what happened to you. So, I mean, can you talk about uh, where did you get hit? What happened? All right, so I'm dragging this this Afghan and this the mach this one machine gun doing a grenade. And I thought I thought it, it killed this guy. I must have just stunned him for a minute. He opens up on our platoon leader, which is he's across from me. Okay, so I stop dragging this casually. He starts shooting where I think this PK PKM gunner is. I'm missing him, so he transitions to me, and the first round hits my. Excuse me, it's pollen season here. I'm gonna. <laughs> Can't stay. I'm all stopped up. Anyway, he transitions to me. The first round hits my leg, my right leg, uh, right above the knee, and it knocks me forward into this Superman position. 
So the next round hits my my upper back on the right side, you know, misses doesn't hit the plates at that point. I'm, I'm vertical as opposed to the prone, but airborne. Uh, hits my my shoulder blade and travels down my back, lodges in my near my spine, and it breaks through the ar- the artery back there, the brachial nerve complex, and then another round like tag my butt, and then I land in this this poop ditch. Right, this is how it works there. Like all this poop is yeah. going down this little ditch. I landed in that thankfully because the rest of the rounds went went around me. And a peak ammo has a hundred round belt, so he's got to reload. So when he exhausted his ammo in my head like okay now i know where he's at now i'm gonna kill this guy so i get back up and i go to engage and i can't use my arm i can't physically bring my weapon up and it felt like a sledgehammer hit me when he when he when i got shot so i was like okay this is problematic um now i can't physically drag this guy anymore so because the way i couldn't grab with my left hand the way the way everything was so i right. looked at the FBI next to me he's like hey grab this dude drag him around the corner let's get out of here so then you know in the video you see from my my medic standpoint, you see me come around the corner and tell him that I'm hit. And then, yeah. And then that, like, and so, go back so to be second, clear, like we're right? talking about movies. It's combat's not like a movie. It's one, it's right. terrifying. I don't care. Like yes. how much of a badass you think you are, you're going to be scared in combat. You just got to be able to work through that. And that's why you train over and over and over again. So some things just become autopilot and you, you learn to, to manipulate your, your fight or flight response and be able to, to consciously put yourself into, a calmer mode to where you can do the things like you see in the video, just be calm, even though, you know, everything's gone to shit. So yeah, it's terrifying. It's not pretty. It's not as fast as that. It's always slower and it's human, right? Like and humans right. are emotional beings. They ever think that we're logical beings, you're fooling yourself. So everything we do is like a conscious effort to be logical and not let emotions get in the way of decision making. So yeah, it's, a, it's, you know, when I came around the corner, I'm still terrified, like moving out there, I'm terrified. Um, there's you know, people shooting at you, trying to kill you, and then coming around, you're still terrified. But if you watch the video, you're like, oh, it's just these guys are calm. It's just like a normal day for them. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, 100%. And then watching you, uh, it's kind of like mind boggling, you know, how and obviously you're terrified, right? But just how calm and how slow it seems to play out on camera. You know, you come back, you drop your kit, which. By the way, like you weren't able to get your weapon up. Like, how the hell do you get your kit off? But you, but you do it. We practice that, like over and over. Like, okay, what yeah. happens if I can't use my right arm? What happens if I can't use my left arm? Like, how do you get your kit off? Like, that's a scenario we had trained for over and over and over again. You know, what happens if I go down? What happens if anybody goes? How do you get your stuff off? Like, where's, you know, where's everything located at? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I think people don't understand those the muscle movements, right? Those constant repetitions of training and EOD. We do it a lot with, with the EOD team leader. Like what happens if the team leader goes down in a bomb suit that weighs a hundred pounds, because you're not dragging a dude who weighs two thirty plus a hundred pounds, you know, in a bomb suit. Uh, and so what do you do? Um, and just sort of kind of watching that video of just your communication with your medic, right. Talking about like, Hey, I'm hit here and this is what's going on. Uh, it's pretty impressive and pretty, pretty humbling to watch. So what, what happens next, right? You're still coherent. You've been shot three times, right? In the knee, in the, in the back, in the butt. Um, what happens next? There's still a firefight going on. Still a firefight. In the video, you can hear A-10s coming in. Thankfully. So the A-10s had heard what had happened with the Apaches. They they didn't ask for permission to engage. They they knew where they were going to shoot. They came under the raws. Uh, they got cleared by the JTAC. They're like, hey, this is what we're doing. JTAC's like, yep, go for it. They came in and and they, and they started doing gun runs right away. To, this is another size of one enemy force right behind that ambush line, uh, you know, cleaning those those guys up. So while they're doing that, I get back up, ask for my weapon. You know, he's got to, he doesn't really know what the injury is completely, but we know we got a CCP set up because that's our SOP with our PJ at it, you know, uh, back where our command post is. So that's the goal is get me. And then you don't see in the video, but the Afghan got back in there too we got him out of there and uh so move back i'm on accord to our ccp and that's where the, the pj and the delta started working on me and they're like hey it's, it's pretty bad he's got a lot of internal bleeding and they started pumping me full of hex and and some uh some meds but the whole rest of the day was was wild for them and i was i just had breakfast this morning with the medic from that helmet camp footage and you know getting shot that's like one part the whole part the whole rest of the day was crazy like 
you know, the, the AC-130 actually killed the guy that shot me because that dude got on the radio bragging about shooting me. So, I'm like, yep, that's where he's at. Boom, kill him. Um, but they had to go clear an HLZ, and the enemy just surrounded on them. And they've happened to do the Mogadishu mile out of there, just expending all their, their, you know, most of their munitions. And they used an AC-130 to shoot up both sides of the road, killing a lot of people to get back to a place where they could they could exfil. So we didn't actually achieve all our objectives. I mean, our objective was to attrit as many enemy fighters in the area as we could, which we did achieve that. And then, uh, you know, get me and the Afghan get get wounded. They ended up getting me out on a, on a bird. Um, they were going to hoist me out at first. And luckily, the Pedro aircraft got shot up coming in. So. I would have died leaning the voice if they would have done that for sure. Uh, even the birds that came in and got it, they got shot up pretty good. You know, got well, let's back up though, it. really, really quick because you know uh, you're not mobile at this point, correct? No, I'm in a skedco, and they got me. They got me strapped up real tight because they'd rigged it for hoist. So I was like a just a, a very tight taco. And so a lollipop sticking out, a little fentanyl lollipop. Yeah, a little fentanyl lollipop. Yeah. You know what? Like what goes through? your mind if you even remember at that point where you are like you're incapacitated you have been immobilized you know you're you're in the skidoo you're strapped down but there's still a battle going on you know there's still a firefight going on and so like you know if you even remember like what goes through your mind and something like that like where you're just helpless yeah that's it's so weird i didn't have a pistol or anything because i couldn't move my arms but when they were moving to this HLZ, it was the captain and our medic carrying the sked kill first. And they, we had sent the advance party out to secure the HLZ and they had to fight the enemy off that. And then we had a, a party that was supposed to be behind us. And then the captain and, and me and the medic. But what happened is, is everybody, all the Afghans just ran to the HLZ. So it left the captain and me and the medic by ourselves. And, they would fight their way through the streets and uh, they'd stop and shoot. And then every time we we're coming through a threshold, the medical again was like, Chuck, I'm sorry, this is going to hurt. Right? They jammed me through this this door and it would and it, it hurt pretty bad every time. And uh, I remember at one point the medic was just, he was just dripping sweat. He's so tired. He's like, man, he's like, like, how much further do we have? And the captain's like, look, they're sitting over the radio right now. They're getting chatter that they know we're left and we're behind and they are going to snatch us up and they're going to, they're going to kill all of us and Chuck. So we got to go. Um, so they ended up just picking up and, and, you know, it seemed like forever. It probably took about 30, 40 minutes of fighting. You know, they, they came back, they'd radioed the, the situation to the Americans. You know, there wasn't that many of us. When I say seven Americans and, and uh, you know, 70, 77 people total, seven Americans, like I think there was five Green Berets. So, you know, they had to send guys back to receive me and these guys, bring us in. And then as this firefight's going on in, in these compounds, people are coming over me and, See a guy like, hey, Chuck, you okay? You some water? He's like, hey, okay. And they exchange magazines over me and like, okay, because we're running low on ammo. Like, yep, okay. This is what they'd be like, good luck, Chuck, going back up. And it's just this huge firefight. And finally, they came back like, hey, um, the, the medevac's coming in and they're going to kick us some ammo too. But we got to get you prepped. They brought me out to the HLZ and, uh, you know, I'm just looking up at the sky. So I just remember getting loaded on the bird and it flying off. And and then when we got to the hospital, uh, that's, that's, that's where I, my definition of pain was redefined because they'd given me a bunch of Hexton to keep me alive, which kept my blood pressure up. But I didn't have any red blood cells because I'd been bleeding out internally for so long. So when I got inside the operating table or in the operating room, they're like, man, this guy has no SpO2. Like his blood oxygen levels, are, this guy's crashing. He's dying, but his blood pressure is good. So they didn't want to put me under. So they gave me enough disassociate to where they thought I was knocked out. But the reality was, I was conscious for the entire surgery where they're fixing the the artery in my back, but I couldn't move. I couldn't speak. So I'm like inside, I'm just like yelling the whole time. And then when I woke up, they were talking to me like, yeah, you could tell me, we could tell that you're feeling pain, but there's nothing we could do about it. And we couldn't put you under because we didn't know what was going on. So, you know, sorry, that's just what it was. It was the, it was the best thing. And the artery busted open again. So that I go back in there, but yeah, it's it pretty awesome. I mean, so you were you were back stateside, you know, my understanding is within 10 days of that incident, uh, you know, overall in your career, over 30 surgeries to to fix you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just had my 31st and, surgery since 2008. Had other surgeries and, before that, but, but combat right. related stuff, 31. 31 surgeries for combat. I mean, that that's ridiculous. 
Right. I mean, a lot of it was, maybe we can't count some because a lot of it was on the face and like fixing teeth and all that stuff. So I'm pretty sure we can actually count all of it, man. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it all counts. And so I'll ask you the same question that I asked you at the beginning of the interview is you go back to the States. Your recovery process is, is long, right? Actually, no, not for that one. I was, I redeployed that trip. That same rotation, that, that same, same deployment. Rotation you went back. Yep. Yeah. So. Um, but this brings back the question. I, I wasn't quite ready. I don't think I still could right. move my arm in certain ways. But uh, they told me I couldn't come back. I actually snuck in. Uh, I got real drunk one night. I called the, the CSM. He's like, Chuck, like, we've agreed you're not coming back in. I was like, look, I'm going to take myself a civilian flight to Germany. So unless you put guards at every airport, you're not going to stop me. I'm going to give myself seven days of paid vacation. I'm going to hop on a, a medevac bird. That's exactly what I did. And when I got there, they were really mad at me. Um, they were not happy. Like, okay, you're here. It's a testament to the, the Thor 3 program that you could recover in two and a half months. So we are pissed at you. But you can go to the fire base. You just can't go out on another combat mission. But I am getting back out on another combat mission, which they were also pissed off about that. Um, that's what it was. <laughs> I mean, like, I don't, I don't really know what to follow up with with that one, right? Because it's like, you know, I know you answered the question at the beginning right uh about why you do what you do yeah but that one was different but, so it was selfish i was for me like this time i in my mind i convinced myself that i was letting the team as a team sergeant i was letting the team down and if i didn't get back into combat i was failing the team so I, that's what i convinced myself of that time around. so that one was much less like me just trying to prove something to myself and me for, fully believing that it was it was a disservice to the team that if I didn't, if I didn't make it back there. Yeah. And so you still got to, you st no, I don't think it's true either, but I mean, like here you are, right. Still, still out there. You got to go out again. Um, and then you deployed again after that, correct? Yeah. Next year we were back in Afghanistan, back with, um, six special operations, Kandak. Yeah. And you get shot and, again. So. And you, that's what I was about to say, like, and then you get shot again and there's like this, this, you know, uh, photo of you online where like, your hand is all just, you know, yeah, wrapped one, up which, in your, which works well. Yeah. Like they did a good job. I mean, none of these bones like, are mine, but it works. It's crazy, man. You're the bionic man. But like what, what happened in that situation? Cause the photo is pretty wild. I mean, if you know, I'm going to post it right up here. Um, for anybody that's watching this, if you're listening, like here you have Chuck hand all bandaged up, like just bleeding everywhere, like all over your kit. But, like you just look like a badass in the photo, right? You're kind of sitting there. Um, what What's the story? What happened there? I still remember how many missions into this trip that was. We were up in Kunduz, which is interesting. We we're working on just just south of where we were working in Tajikistan. We were up there you know, a couple of years prior, so now we we're down in Kunduz, which is right on the border there. And, and the Taliban were just they'd taken over that area a couple of times and then been pushed out. So we'd been brought in with six special operations came back to help the core there push the Taliban out of the area. And we were looking at all the wrong places. And finally, the, the core S2 came in. It's like, hey, guys, the enemy is literally three kilometers from us. You guys are looking way up here. And we're like, nah, that's not true. And the, the Afghan commander who we're working with, is, no, I think this guy knows what he's talking about. Come look at this map. I look at this map, and this would have put most of our people to shame. That This S2 had this map with the most immaculate, you know, operational terms and graphics. And it was, I was like, man, I, I've never made a product that, that amazing. I'm, I'd been an 18 Fox and, and a special forces Intel sergeant at that point. So I was like, man, man, this guy knows what he's talking about. So our, our commanders decided that, Hey, we're going to go see if this is real. So in the morning, we're going to go out by ourselves and we're just going to do a reconnaissance and see if the enemy is really there. And fun fact, the enemy was there. And at the time we were <laughs> living in this area of the old base and we were living in such abysmal conditions. The Afghans wouldn't live with us. I remember like we're all supposed to live in the same area and the Afghan commander was like, Chuck, we can't live here. Like, pooping in the bags and there's no running water like you guys kind of look like savages like we're gonna go live up here with the core so for us to take showers and have hot food we would actually go to the afghan compound and do that which is kind of backwards right it's kind of weird right. but, uh, we went over to take showers and the team leader's in the shower and i'm waiting to take a shower and our battalion commander and the afghan commander come in like Chuck, come here they're like check out this video and they show me this video of Dismounted dishkas, like shooting at Afghans and like helicopters. Like, what is that? It's like, that's your commando. So they brought a company and they reinforced them with an armored company. So there's two companies of commandos up there right now, pinned down, 
they are surrounded. They can't move. Oh, well, that sucks because that's our partner force. We have a partner force. Like, no. Fun fact, they left 20 Afghans back here that they did not want to take on the objective with them because they say they're you know, crazy or they're, they're not good soldiers. So they left them. Like, okay, cool. Like, we would like you to take those 20 Afghans, load up in three MI-17 Russian-made helicopters, flown by Afghan pilots, and we would like you to land in the middle of the day and uh, link up, land in this firefight, link up with the Afghans, take control, and then pull them out. That's, that sounds real dumb. <laughs> um so the team that comes out of shower talk like this is a crazy this is a crazy proposal but we're green berets and you know, we're gonna do it right because you know, green berets not like it's not the sexy thing it's literally dirty deep done dirt cheap you are force multipliers in the battlefield you know it's it's us working with low american footprint low cost you know doesn't require a lot of resources and we're going to use mainly indigenous um, solutions to solve a problem so that's what this was we're like okay well this is less than ideal, but we're going to do it. So I plan HLZ. Usually the captain's in the lead bird. I put myself in the lead bird because it's going to be pretty nasty landing. Um, we knew that, but we also thought that we we're going to land and we're going to be leading with the Afghans because that's what we briefed. Um, we got Apaches. And we briefed the Apaches. We're, we're right there with us, the, the pilots, because we're all co-located in this in space. We're like, yep, this is what's going to happen. Coming in, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on their comms. I'm like, yep, HLZ is clean. And right as we're landing, like, cool. But as we start to land, like, all of a sudden, daylight starts popping in through the, the MI-17 from where bullets are coming in. Like, this does not seem like a clean HLZ at all. And we get off the ramp, and it's just, you know, multiple four to five machine gun positions. A ton of really pissed off people that were there. I'm right on top of us. And as I'm surveying there, I'm like, okay, I don't see any Afghans. Where are the helicopters? So they, they called clean HLZ because they were on the wrong HLZ. So the Apaches were, like, three kilometers away. And then... You know, three kilometers away on the wrong HLZ. And not even on the right comms. The JTAC sitting next to me is like, I don't have comms with them. It's crazy. So I pulled, went to an alternate freak, got comms with the, the Apaches. And I made an assessment. I was like, okay, we can assault 300 meters. I'm sorry, we can assault 150 meters into four to five machine gun positions, or we can move the other way through an open field for 300 meters. All right. So the best bad decision that we could make was to assault into fortified machine gun positions. So that's what we did. So that's how combat is, right? You have dilemmas. You got to make the best bad decision you can make. So as we are doing that, um, you know, a couple minutes off the bird, my last three to five second rush to this burn, which is the only cover that we have, uh, take a peek aim around through my middle knuckle, um, goes through my hand, comes out the side and blows out all the, the bones in my hand. Lesson learned here is, I don't know why I did that for this flight, but I put my compass, I moved it slightly over to the right, and I put all my graphics and maps in my right cargo pocket, which is a no-go. Like, all of our stuff is always supposed to be set up to be in ejector. For some reason, I did that, so I couldn't get to any of my stuff that I needed. Like, my compass, I was having to bleed all over my JTAC stuff. But for the first time that I ever remember in combat, like, you're always terrified, right? But the first time, like, it was overwhelming to me, and I actually shut down for a second because there was so much machine gun fire coming in. There was so much dirt coming up, I couldn't even see. And it felt like everybody was just focused on me, enemy-wise. Man. We are all going to die here because, you know, arrogance really like thinking that we can do these impossible things. And, you know, me advocating for this mission, even though, you know, I'm the one who decided or even asked to do it, I'm going to get all these guys killed. And then, you know, I'm like sitting there poopy lip for a second. Like, Wait a minute, that's stupid. Like, I'm, not, I'm an unstoppable force in nature. This is, this is dumb. I like, right. snapped out of it and bleeding everywhere. And for the first time in combat, too, it had double feed on my weapon, right? I've had other malfunctions, but so I'm. Trying to fix his double feet, I'm all bleeding into the chamber of my rifle. It sucks. Um, so I just look over to the JTAC and I look, hey, I'm pushing the Apaches to your freak. This is what I need to happen. They're going to be on station here on this over us in 20 seconds. This is what we need to happen. Call the, call the captain. I was like, hey, I'm about to use your initials on, on some things. Uh, and he was making his way up the line. So got the Apaches in. They're doing runs and got some uh, some bombs dropped. And we we handled that situation. We were able to assault further into that, that those positions. and and free up some space while we linked up with the Afghans. Because also, oh yeah, I had my cell phone in my right pocket too. It was blowing up off the hook. It was the, the Afghan platoon sergeant we're supposed to link up with. So I finally had the medic get my get my phone out. So I'm finally talking to that guy would link up. Um, move back, link up with the Afghans. But instead of pulling out, um, you know, they're trying to medevac me. I'm like, no, we're not going to medevac. We just bandaged up my hand. We're like, we're going to, we're working the team leader. We made the decision, that, hey, we're going to assault into these enemy positions. That's what we did. I just gave up my assault element to another senior guy, and, and I transitioned to 
controlling the armored force in the middle. And then, you know, these guys got online and they cleared through, even though, again, their teams aren't shot up. They, but we trained over and over on these things. We had so many SOPs that it was just like, this is what's going to happen when this happens. And, you know, they Does it ever it cross your and, mind? Like, you know, at th at this point, right uh you get blown up really badly in 2008 uh you know you you get shot up again on a on a concurrent deployment and now here you are getting shot for the third time right or getting hurt for the third time like does anything go through your mind at that moment where you're like maybe this isn't for me or like maybe i am just like the ship magnet that all this stuff gravitates towards like does that go through your mind or is it just stay on stay on task stay on mission and I was like, man, I got an expert instruments badge. Like, maybe I need to go revalidate or something. Maybe I'm just too slow. And my three to five second rushes are like seven to eight seconds or something. Something's off here. Uh, now, I mean, you know, you're like, oh, this guy gets shot. Like, maybe that is a testament. Not being very good. I don't know. Uh, you know, or are you taking unnecessary risks? Like, to me, every time it's been unnecessary risk. Like, hey, if we don't get this guy, it's going to happen. So the risk is worth it. You know, if we don't do this mission where we go in these 20 Afghans and helicopters, Literally the whole campaign there was over. So the risk to mission was so great that it was worth the risk to do that. You know, and again, battalion commander, who's a very awesome guy, I just saw him the other day. If he's advocating for it, then hey, let's do it. Um, so I don't know. It's you never really think that. Like, hey, this is the wrong profession. I'm not, I'm not just like okay, well, nobody's standing I mean, near me because obviously I'm a <laughs> I'm a bullet. Right. Man, it so. just seems like it just seems like it follows you, you know, around, but at the end of the day, like here you are, you're you're still standing, you know. Um, you know, moving forward in your career, so you know, you just wrapped up being uh, the deputy commandant over at the NCO Academy or there the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare School. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and so when we talk about that transition from the tactical level into you know, um, developing the next generation, right? Uh, in from a doctrinal sense, what is that transition like? You know, going from being on the ground, running and gunning, to now we're we're back into development of the next generation. It's, it's a weird transition, right? After after getting shot in the hand, I was the senior leader course first sergeant for at the NCO Cat, same NCO Academy. It's it's a special operations exclusive one, right? You're Right. Special Forces, PSYOP, or, or Civil Affairs, and you'll come to our academy. I enjoy it. I like education. I'm a big doctrinal guy anyway, even at the tactical level. There's nothing that trumps basic you know, fire maneuver. Like what used to be 7 8, it's now 321 8 10. Like you should know that as the back of your hand. Uh, just understanding, you know, we call it MDO now, and, you know, we, we call it different things at different times, but just fire a maneuver like the basics of what you should know doctrinally is incredibly important and every anytime i hear like an officer somebody say like oh like it's, we don't use our own doctrine it's not important to use it like that person doesn't know what they're talking about right um do we adjust it yeah absolutely but we we use our fire maneuver doctrine that's why we were able to that's why air land battle doctrine and desert storm it works so well it's the same things we use now and just being able to teach that to the younger generation and, and try to get people to take you know, take those concepts and have it important to them instead of just saying, hey, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to rely on my own innate genius and, rehabilit and ability to reinvent the wheel every time. People love to do that, right? People say, oh, no, we don't do that. We operate outside the box. See, if you still got to understand the box, like you're going to use something that's in the box as a springboard, right? And if you don't understand the box, which is all your doctrine, your regulations, and everything in the Army, you're not operating outside the box. You're literally just pulling things out of your ass and hoping they work, right? So, right. Teaching that to people, like understanding the rules of the game is very important, right? Like we all chose to play this game called the Army. It's a game, right? Everything's, everything can be put in terms of a game. We, we chose to play this game called the Army, which there are rules. But if I were to sit down at a table full of four people playing Monopoly or three people, I'm going to be the fourth player playing Monopoly. If I wish to win that game, I got I to gotta use the rules, right? If I just sit down and make up my own rules, it's going to piss everybody off and I'm going to lose, right? I dominate the game Monopoly by understanding the rules and using those to win. And then when I understand those rules, then I can, you know, maybe I break them a little bit or bend them here and there a little bit. But it's no different than the Army. If you want to thrive in the Army, especially as you go up in rank, you have to understand the rules of the game, right, to play the game effectively. You know, sometimes you, can, you don't always have to be constrained by the rules completely, but you know what they are. 
And then you can also weaponize some of it, especially when it comes to like resources and and convincing your commander. Commander exists to give you really a handful of things, right? They're going to underwrite risk. Uh, they're going to give you resources, right? And they're going to somehow give you the time to do things, right? That's what they're going to do. They're going to give you the permissions to do something. And you've got to be able to convince that person. And if you can do that using the rules and you can tie them to their intent, it allows that person like, yep, that makes sense. You know, there's six people in a room vying for resources and two of them are clearly like, hey, this is I didn't ask for this. Like the, the rules say I need 60,000 rounds. Like it's just right here in the track manual and your guidance is this. And this is this is why I need these resources. And the, the other four are like, no, I just think it'd be cool to have this. He's going to give it to the people that are actually articulating what they need properly by using the, the rules to their advantage. Have you enjoyed your time over there? I mean, obviously you're starting to make the transition out of the military. Uh, you're over 20 years, you know, you've had a very successful and obviously storied career from what we've talked about, you know, for the last hour. Um, you know, when we talk about mentorship and development, what is kind of your goal when you talk to the next generation of soldiers as far as what you want for them and, uh, you know, like, where did you get your mentorship and development coming up? I've been blessed with both very good and very bad leaders. So, you know, you can learn just as much from a bad leader that you can from a, a good leader, right? And just always checking your ego and ensuring that, that we're learning from every opportunity, I think, is important as a leader. But, you know, working over an institution like that, where it's, it's a PME, right? It's a professional military educational institution. I think a lot of times we we kind of poop on that in the military. Like, oh, I got to go to SLC or I got to go to this and you know it's not cool it, it's not cool because it's education it's not training but it's important um we and you have talked about this offline but it goes to what I call yeah. chess theory you know in, in the military as you move up the ranks you know your lower ranks like E1 through E5 you're you're a chess piece you're allowed to have the time to understand your your job like how to move around the board like okay how do I operate my weapon system how do I operate the smart 19 how do I do you know, bandages, how do I do a litter? How do I do these specific tasks? But at some point in time when the military chooses to promote you to E6 or E7, they're not going to pay you extra money because you're cool or you're entitled to it. What they want you to do is now you need to take a step back and be able to understand the rules of the game, which allows you to become a chess player. So you can move multiple pieces around the board because you understand the board better and you understand the rules of the game to at a point to where you can do that. Because behind all the stuff you're doing, there's a lot of rules that go into, hey, how do I use this system called Tamus for ammo and this system called Rhythmus for, for ranges and how do I do X? Like there are rules to this game that if you don't understand, you're not going to get what you need. And then understanding commander's guidance and understanding like, oh, I'm going to go down range. I got money. There are literally laws, fiscal authorities that, that cover that. So how do you keep yourself out of, out of trouble and how do you plan to where you can get the resources you need, but then you can operate effectively down range where nobody's going to jail and you can do what you're being asked to do. And that stuff's not sexy. It's not fun. You know, I got the range shooting. You get, you're taking a step back when it comes to the education piece. It's, it's you know, book learning, you know, for all intents right. and purposes. But it's incredibly important if you want to be effective at that next rank, right? Relevancy. Relevancy is, is easily lost like a fart in the wind, right? Like just because you were awesome yesterday at this job, moving to a new position doesn't, that doesn't matter because nobody cares what you did. What do you bring into the table today? So if you're not coming educated, you know, what do you bring to the table? And just because you're awesome at this thing doesn't mean you're going to be awesome at this next thing. So did you take the time to to learn what it is that you actually have to do? Uh, you know, and eventually, you know, that chess piece, when you move up to be you're an E8 or an E9, now you need to be that chess master. And you need to understand those rules, especially for us. Like for me as enlisted, you know, if I'm coming to you, you're an officer. You don't you don't need a guy kicking in doors and that can shoot well. You need somebody that can combine their experience with knowing what they're talking about, being educated to help you make decisions and to be able to, to implement um, whatever the intent is within the confines of mission command. So that's what I've enjoyed about being over the NCO Academy, because I also get to go teach at the Army Special Operations Captain's Crew Course um, in the interface of the Warrant Officer Institute there, too. So just being able to pass that knowledge on and, you know, some other tidbits we haven't covered, leadership stuff yet, but like, you know, what makes a good leader and why, and especially in in these realms, like in special operations, egos are, you know, very inflated and everything's so awesome. Like, how do you deal with that? How do you deflate those so people don't don't um, confuse being competent and confident with being, you know, cocky prick and, and ruining everything? 
So that's what I've enjoyed the most. That's a long tirade. I'm very passionate about this stuff. I'm a big doctrine guy. Like if you ever come, I got almost all your military doctrine in big stacks. It's all tabbed out. It's highlighted. You know, memorize it. But at least I know where to look when I need it because it is important. Right. I mean, you know, you kind of touched on the the leadership uh, standpoint right there. You know, lately, you know, in the last year or so, you've started uh, social media. Right. So you've started uh, being pretty, pretty vocal, um, you know, on X, formerly known as Twitter, uh, you know, a lot of jokes. Right. A lot of a lot of really good tidbits. I mean, I think you've been accused of stolen valor a couple of times. All on these there. people are always like, there's no way this is you or you did that. Like, you know, you're never going to see me like just be disrespectful or get mad. I don't get most. Right. Respect. If you want to come at me on, on social media, then have fun with it. I'll, I mean, I'll have you fun have. With it yeah, I mean, look, you have enough valor. I feel like at this point, like you don't need to steal it. You can probably rent some out to people, uh, you know, silver star, bronze star for valor, um, you know, four meritorious bronze stars, Arcom valor, like multiple Thalus rewards, three purple hearts. Uh, and, you know, the big one that we don't ever talk about enough is eight good conduct medals. Oh, yeah, that's important. How, how eight, cool eight good, good conduct, conduct medals, right? Like an officer doesn't get good conduct medals because they yeah. expect... They're like, these guys are supposed to be well-behaved gentlemen, but the enlisted corps, they know that we're so, you know, just always on that cusp of doing something stupid that if we do well, you know, if, if we're good, you get a medal for it. How cool is that? Like, right. I'm going to give you the, this medal for not, not screwing something up for X number yeah, that, of years. That, the hatchet-wielding enlisted, right? I mean, but, you know, we we need that in the force to to make it run. I mean, you talk about twice two deployments where you effectively snuck in a country where you were told hey you're not going on this deployment and then lo and behold you you appear and there you are right i mean i think that's a testament uh, one to to your character and your dedication to the profession of arms but also like what if you just been like okay yeah i'm done you know like i i think the amount of good that you've done in the force is is substantial Right. Uh, should have been the amount I of... should have been med board a long time ago, right? But in yeah. the early days, I would just keep my own medical records. I couldn't. And then I got most of my surgeries done off post, and I haven't put those in my medical records. So it's, it's been a good buffer for me there. Well, you got to now, right? You're you're heading towards retirement. Um, and so I don't want to put you on the spot with this question, uh, but I'm going to anyways, right? So what do you have a plan for, for once you're out? Are you going to take some time off and relax, or are you going to jump back into something? Actually, I'm probably going to take a little bit of time off. I mean, here's what I would recommend for anybody. Your last couple of years in the military, even before that, like really start educating yourself on business. Like get a LinkedIn account, make that substantial. But also, it's worth it to pay for LinkedIn learning. You can get it for free for a year um, if you're in the military. But the LinkedIn learning portion, there's some great stuff in there for like just learning business acumen and and understanding what things are in the real world. Don't let anybody fool you. Like there's there's just as many acronyms out, out there that are, that are on the military. Like, oh, you know, like military's acronyms. They have more acronyms than we do. I'm sitting, I was in Hibbit Sports a couple weeks ago, sitting there, and I'm just taking notes again. I'm there quite a bit. And I'm like, what does this stuff mean? How am I here all the time? I don't know. It's like, oh, yeah, we just made those. Um, but understanding what a lot of those things mean. And, you know, I've got a couple of LLCs right now that, you know, they exist. So I can get out right now and just kind of chill out. I, I do need to get off my, my butt and finish my bachelor's degree. It's, it's probably going to take me about six months after I retire to, to finish up that from Norwich. But I think in that time frame, I might, you know, people think like, oh, you're joking. Like, I might just deliver pizzas and, I don't know, do something, be an Uber driver or something. Just kind of throttle back for a little bit and uh, do it. Lot, right? I mean, you know, I think anybody who knows you or, you know, feels like they know you after they've listened to this podcast, like absolutely do it, man. You've earned it. You've earned whatever it is that you want to do. Uh, hey, I really hope that, you know, uh, one, we can continue our, our dialogue offline as, as we've been doing. Um, there is one final topic that we do have to discuss before I let you go. And that locker. is, it's the Hurt Locker, yes. right? It is the number, number one war movie uh, the 2008 Oscar winning acclaimed movie, The Hurt Locker. Uh, and I want your thoughts on it so I can tell you why you're wrong and that why it's the best movie ever. 
I'm going to give you my actual, me and you talk about this all the time, right? But I'm going to give you my actual story of the Hurt Locker. I was in Iraq in Talfar in 2005. We were partnered with the 3rd ACR with HR McMaster's. We had four or five special forces teams there. And it was a wild trip. Like, I've never seen anything like that. Like, that's, you know, Cavs going away, I guess, unfortunately. But that's, you know, I have a whole new respect for <laughs> Bradley's and the Cavalry after that trip. Um, and just the, the valor that those guys displayed. I saw those, those young guys that's, Stuff I've never seen any special operations people do. But anyway, we're like, hey, let's watch the Hurt Locker. I mean, it took me like seven iterations to watch this thing. Um, and when it got to the 50 cal scene with the blood, and maybe I missed my first sniper shot in combat with a bear um, because I didn't check the front pin. The, the guy that set it up and spotted it <laughs> didn't put the front pin in, so I shot it. The thing came apart. So again, my fault for not checking the pin. Um, but maybe I was holding that against the Hurt Locker just because they had a bear. And I don't know. But the whole movie was like, I was like, this is ridiculous. Um, yeah, you know the joke of the hurt locker is no right. I mean, and the joke of the hurt locker is this is like it, it kind of started as a joke on on Twitter, right? Where I was like, I love the hurt locker, but we've reached a point where people legitimately believe that I think it's the greatest war movie ever created. And so, kind of the joke is like, I have seen the hurt locker in its entirety one time, like once. I have started that movie multiple times since those. As a matter of fact, I think I tried to watch it like three weeks ago and I cannot get through, like, I just can't get through it. Right. It's just from, from a cinematic standpoint, like, yeah, it's not a bad movie. Um, you know, scenes, as an, right? yeah, like the scenes are cool. Yeah. But when you put it all like, together, you're like, what are we doing here? Yeah, like as an EOD technician, like, and having done the job on deployment, uh, it, it's hard to watch. You know, and then, of course, you know, my wife won't watch it because she thinks that's like what I did. And I'm like, no, 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 absolutely not. I would never do anything this foolish. But like, I have some great stories because of that movie. Um, And so like one of them is we're on deployment and my team, I'm a team member. So EOD is broken down into three person teams. You have a team leader who's the person who puts on the bomb suit and does the hands on stuff. And then you have two team members who effectively, you know, manage the scene, run tools, build explosive charges, things like that. And so. You know, I got this prior 11 Bravo team leader who's, he's awesome, right? Like he's just, but you know, he's, he's got some Hurt Locker built into him, right? And so we're working on this IED uh, in an open field and there's a village, like, and there's a village probably a click away and Rob gets on the, the radio and he's like, they're watching me. And I'm like, yeah, no shit, Rob. There's nothing going on out here, right? Like they're, they're sitting on top of the buildings watching you. That's a good thing. That means we're probably not going to get shot at. And he's like, I'm deploying smoke. And so like, there's that scene in the movie in the hurt locker where like he pops smoke grenades and he walks down range. Right. Well, like I watch Rob pop these smoke grenades and like, no shit. As soon as he pops these smoke grenades, the winds shift. Right. And oh, all I hear you. is him is like, yeah. <laughs> no, down there working on it, <laughs> like working in a haze and he comes back up range. And I'm like, dude, you're an idiot. I love you. You know? And it's just like those little stories. When I was a team leader in 2013, uh, my team members before they would let me walk down range in the bomb suit would make me give a hurt locker quote. Ooh, right. I like that, like yeah. I, I had to give a hurt locker quote to them. So it was always something like, you know, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die comfortable, you know, which, <laughs> you know, throw the bomb suit off and go down there. But, you know, all joking aside about the movie, I will tell you what it did is it provided some visibility to a career field that prior to GWAT was not very well known. Um, and so I, I was going through EOD school when the movie came out. All right. And so of course we were all called the hurt locker generation, but there were a lot of people that joined the military and joined EOD specifically because of that movie. So do I think it's a good movie? It's a good movie. Do I think it's an accurate representation of what EOD techs do on the ground? Uh, I do not, but it helped build the force. And so, all day long, I will I will trumpet that movie on on social media. There's gonna be a lot of people that are upset if they actually listen to this whole interview and find out that I'm not actually a fan of the movie. Nah, to be clear, yeah. did you know, you know EOD actually falls under the special operations recruiting? Here? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And if you're watching this and you want to go EOD, go talk to a SORB recruiter. Yeah, and so you know, I'll go on my tangent here for a second about EOD, but like now we've consolidated. Um, everything down to phase one at Greg Adams when it comes to testing. So, but before it was you do your bomb suit test at a localized unit. So I was an 18 X ray, a uh, little known fact about me, right? Did not make it through selection. I was a non-select and. Uh, oh, gotcha. 
we can talk about that offline. The PT test, the PT test. I did 27 sit-ups is what I was told. So I, I did a like 82 push-ups. I ran a 1236, but I did 27 sit-ups. So that was Actually, enjoyable. A lot of people, you'd be surprised at how many, like they don't do sit-ups now anymore, but sit-ups was like the main thing. I forgot most people. Yeah. And so I got called into an office and the, you know, the cadre member was like, Hey man, you want to go EOD? And I'm like, I don't know what the hell that is. And he goes, well, it's not ground pounding in the 82nd. And I was like, so all my buddies are going to the 82nd, all the non-selects. And I'm not opposed to that. Right. But I was like, you know, let me, let me try this out. And so I went to EOD school and kind of like, I couldn't fail. Right. Like you can't fail EOD school because I'm a technically qualified 11 Bravo. I've never been to a line unit, right? I've only been through OSIT. Um, I failed selection. And now if I go to EOD school and fail EOD school, I'm going to show up to a line unit three years after everyone else has been there and like I uh, failed two schools in the military. It's not going to go well for me. You know, and that was kind of my driving factor. Yeah, to make an it officer, so you can't do that, right? Like, well, this was, yeah, this was, you know, this was enlisted me. Oh, um, that's right. Cause you went to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I commissioned at, at the 10 year mark, but you know, that was my story about how I got over to EOD. And, and the joke was I had no idea what EOD like even stood for till I got to school. And I was like, Oh no shit. Like I'm going to work on explosives. Like, I guess, I guess this is what I'm doing now. People um, need to know though, I can only speak from my personal experience, but you were going to get used and abused as a EOD guy. And I'd say this in a good way. Like, like I said, like we would take 74s, chemical guys, an EOD guy for each element in a dog. Now that was our, that was our, like if we were going to go do this mission and it's a strike mission, those are the other MOSs that are going to come with us at all times. Right. And then when we're out there, like the EOD guys, you're not just doing close. Like you're going to clear these buildings with these guys. You're going to do X, Y, and Z. So you're still doing everything else on top of, hey, if we find some stuff, like you're yeah. the one going in there um, and good luck. So. Yeah, it's definitely a wild. It's definitely a wild career. I remember thinking, you know, man, I really don't want to like be an infantry guy and ruck up and down the mountains of Afghanistan. And then I remember being an EOD guy attached to an infantry platoon rucking up and down the mountains of Afghanistan. And I'm like looking at them and they're carrying like assault packs with like some extra magazines. And like, I'm carrying a robot and I'm like, dude, I messed up. Like I should have just gone over there right. and done that. Right. It's been a, it's been a fantastic experience. You know, if anybody's watching this and is interested, yes. Um, EOD does fall underneath sword recruiting. And then yes, we do provide a lot of support to ODAs when they deploy. We do, you know, a lot of the same train up uh, with the groups before we go. So you know, if you're looking for a job, you know, uh, I know some people that can gray, help you out. Right. Same thing. Sorb. And it's not all yeah. about getting shot. And like, I have my best stories or you know, my best memories aren't my combat deployments. All the other great world yeah. travels like, and hung out in the United Arab Emirates for three months. One time where, you know, we're there up in Tajikistan, all these other places across the globe that you get to go and, and do things. Jordan. And it's a life of adventure. Um, yeah. Right. It's not, it's not all, most of the stuff you're doing isn't, isn't the combat stuff, but it's a small portion of what we do. So I leave you with this final question. With all the stuff that you have been through, all the hardship and injuries, would you do it again? 100%. Yeah. It's been a, been a great career. I'm glad the army did a lot for me. You know, people, you see it on, you know, we both get like all this army hate, like, oh, what do you do? You learn anything? Like, yeah, learning the army is still a great institution. We're perfect now. But you literally signed up for to do a job that's, that's hard, and you know you're going to be doing a bunch of dumb stuff. It's like if you've not watched any military movies, like, this is part of the life. Like, why am I wearing this? I don't know. You are, because to do that stuff, you could do all this other great stuff. So the answer is yes. But I would say one thing before we go is like, if I could go back and give my younger me some advice in the military in general, like, you know, I think we all got to check our egos. We all have an ego, and ego is just a sense of self, right? But when it starts getting at, getting out of control, you know, it's it's what I see trip up most really good officers. At some point in the time, they start believing in their own hype, and then they stop listening to other people, and then they feel like they have all the, the answers. And, you, you know, at any rank does that. You, you walk around like you're this, this badass. There's a fine line between being confident and being that cocky prick, right? When you start getting to that cockiness, it's when you start being dangerous. And then you start, you can't take responsibility for your own actions. So we all, we all screw up. We're all humans. We mess things up all the time. I know at any point in time, I'm be planning or whatever, I know that I'm wrong somewhere. I just got to figure that out. Most of them are going to find that out by listening to other people in the room, 
I'm being okay with it. It's cool to be wrong. It's okay. It's, failure is fine too. There's a difference between, between failure and defeat. Uh, you know, failure is good as long as you're not feeling the same thing over and over again. And being okay with that as a younger person, because I probably didn't learn that until a little bit too late in life, I think. Once, you know, because I sucked in the beginning and I got a little bit too confident and cocky, and then I was like, okay, that's, that's stupid. But yes, I would do it all over again, but I think I would, you know, try to have a little bit more humility because, you know, I trip over my ego all the time too. It's a constant struggle of not believing you're all that awesome because none of us are that awesome. So that's the that's it. Yes, but I would try to be a little more humble. Still be, like, you can have a little bit of, you can be a little bit cocky. Yeah. No, I totally get it. Hey, thank you so much for, for taking the time out of your day to sit down and talk with me and, and, and share your story. Uh, I wish you all the best in, in retirement, and I hope that uh, you and I get to sit down and have a beer again sometime soon. All right. So thank you so much. Absolutely.